Good day, everyone, and welcome to Yes Presents, a Yes Media production where we discuss global issues that impact us all and stories featured in our print magazine. Today, we'll be in conversation with what a lot of folks will consider some heavy hitters, not just big thinkers, but big doers about a framework um, a framework of being that some of you may be familiar with, some of you may not, um, at least in name, because I bet most of you are in practice. Before the term ecological civilization was coined, Yes was telling the stories of communities creating such a society, one that is life affirming and connected to nature. The model of ecological civilization that we explore in our spring issue is one that has been the life work of our co-founder, David Corton, so for this special issue, you'll also hear from David. Um, I had a sit down, a virtual sit down with David and he opens up about his decades of unfolding and emerging and relearning. So that instead of just knowing what he thinks, which some of you are very much familiar with in his many books and his columns at Yes, um, you'll be able to understand why he thinks the way that he thinks and how his thinking has evolved over time. So be sure to check that out. Um, it's in our print magazine. If you all haven't gotten yours yet, this is the lovely cover here. And also the digital version of the magazine online. And just note that the um, print version is an abridged version of the fuller conversation that you'll find online. And so now joining me today to co-host this event is Andrew Schwartz, co-founder and executive vice president of the Institute for Ecological Civilization, our partners for this event. And so here we go, Andrew. Fantastic, thanks Zenobia, happy to be here. And very excited for this uh, conversation today on uh, an ecological civilization. As Zenobia said, we've got a great group of conversation partners that we'll be featuring. Um, the first, Jeremy Lent, author of The Patterning Instinct, A Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning. Uh, another contributor to the New Possible book, Jeremy is also author of an upcoming book, the web of meaning, integrating science and traditional wisdom to find our place in the universe, which will uh, be published later this June. Um, and uh, we'll get started having you, you sort of frame the conversation for us. You frame the uh, magazine issue um, with the opening article there. And in your piece on sort of what ecological civilization looks like, you challenge us to transform the very basis of how human societies are organized. We're talking new systems, new structures that are guided by new values, new worldviews. Now I say new here loosely, because uh, you're clear to, to indicate that this is different than our, our dominant uh, cultural norms, but it's certainly um, something that's been around for a very long time. You also identify six design principles found in nature that you say could, give, uh, could help guide us. Um, so those are diversity, balance, fractal organization, life cycles, subsidiarity, and symbiosis. So just as a snapshot, sort of where does this idea of ecological civilization come from and how did these principles that you just named uh, represent a, a new civilizational paradigm? Yeah, yeah, sure, thank you, Andrew. Well, you know, what gets me so excited about this vision of an ecological civilization is, is both new and ancient. Because ultimately where these ideas come from is in all of our heritage going back thousands and thousands and thousands of years in indigenous knowledge and indigenous wisdom. Um, and that's what we're basically, uh, what people in, in the Western mainstream culture have the ability to rediscover now, to learn from that ancient wisdom and from other wisdom traditions are around the world that have, they're essentially not part of that Western one. And what those wisdom traditions all point to is our deep interrelatedness with each other and with all of life. And in a nutshell, that's what an ecological civilization is about. It's, a, it's actually changing the very foundation, just like you talked about, about civilization. We know, and all of us on, uh, uh, tuned in today, know that this current civilization is leading us to destruction. Uh, but ultimately, it's not about changing a few tactical things here and there, or investing in some new technology or whatever. The way in which we can turn things around is we have to look at the underlying basis of our civilization, which is about wealth, 
just wealth affirming values. It's about extraction. It's about seeing nature as something separate as a resource, even seeing other human beings as a resource to exploit. And it's replacing that with a civilization, an entire civilization based on the principle of life affirming, on flourishing for all, on a, a flourishing human species, on a flourishing uh, living earth. In a nutshell, that's what it's about. Um, I know sometimes people talk about ecological civilization um, as an idea connected to China. So I'm wondering if, if you could say a little bit about sort of how this idea relates to China, but also how what you just described seems to extend far beyond um, any particular Chinese context. Um, yeah, to yeah, I know. It, it's interesting because it's, it's kind of a, a complex issue because in a way, um, we, we see the actual Xi, Xi Jinping, the actual leader of China, talking about how we need to transform our economy to be uh, towards an ecological civilization. If we had, if we saw our president, or if we saw uh, people at the UN standing up saying that, we don't be going great. The problem is that while China speaks a good language in relation to that, some of the fundamental principles we're talking about in an ecological civilization are being basically totally trodden on uh, in what we see in China right now. But one part of an ecological civilization, as we're describing it, as we look at what life tells us about principles, is basically grassroots self-determination. The exact opposite of a, an authoritarian centralized regime telling people what to do. It's about um, groups self-organizing as part of a fractal whole. And so that's one way in which uh, China's actual actions are very different from those words. And the second part is the whole way in which China is one of the uh, greatest contributors to the, uh, the damaging, the devastating impacts of climate breakdown, ecological devastation. It's right now its economy is based on growth and an ecological civilization is all about moving to balance and regeneration with the living earth. So if we see China change both of those major changes, then that's great, that'd be wonderful to see. Until then, we have to build a global sense of an ecological civilization with or without any, um, whichever nation states choose to be part of what, of what we're talking about. Yeah, Thank, thanks for that, Jeremy. I know we wanted to kind of stay on the framework that we put in the magazine and get to that because I did have a question about that as well as far as, because my understanding is that there, succinctly, I guess, is that their goal is to grow D, uh, GDP while protecting the environment. And is that even is that even possible? And so we can kind of get to that a little bit later on. I wanna uh, move on to uh, Winona really quickly. And um, Winona, what you focused on in, in your article was about the work that you all are doing um, with your hemp farm. And as part of that sustainable, and the work is around sustainable tribal economies. Um, and you've been farming hemp, which is the non psychoactive cousin, as you called it in your article of cannabis. And we know that cannabis is a billion dollar industry, um, wherein black, brown and indigenous people have mostly been criminalized, leaving the door wide open for uh, white people, mostly white men to thrive. And so you're and you acknowledge that in your piece. And so your tribe and a growing number of others have found hemp to be the way, as you put it, toward a just transition or the new green revolution. So if you could talk a little bit about why hemp and then share how your business Winona Hemp's operate and then how that connects to this idea of an ecological civilization. Okay, I'm gonna do it in the reverse order. Is that all right? That's fine, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so I wanna talk about what Jeremy was saying. You know, so look, I live in the place where the wild things are. That's indigenous people. We're about 4% of the world's population and about 75% of the world's biodiversity. Mm -hmm. You know, and we didn't uh, do that recently. Pretty much that's what ecological civilization is. People who get to hang out with all that biodiversity are people who live in ecological civilizations, right? And so, you know, my gig is I'm just trying to maintain the ecological civilization. That seemed like a cool thing to do. You know, I mean, if you figured out how to harvest rice from the same lake for, for 10,000 years, wild rice, wild rice, that's what we have, wild rice. Only place it grows in the world. If you could do that for 10,000 years, you've got something going, right? Maple, sugar from a tree, you know, I mean, we get sugar from a tree and, and rice from a lake. That's awesome. You know, so 
of course, you know, if, if you respect Mother Earth, you kind of could get those gifts if you figure out how to live with her. If you spend all your time making a civilization which transforms Mother Earth instead of transforming to be with Mother Earth, you know, it doesn't work out and you end up kind of in what I call Windigo economics. That's like the economics of camps, right? And, and we all kind of acknowledge the situation we're in, which is, you know, the UN even says it, you know, the, you know, corporations can't keep control of the world because we can't survive if that's the way it goes, right? So we're all on this, like how you deconstruct, decolonize. I kind of look at it as that kind of like, let let's things go, get a little space in it, you know, and um, figure out how to get back the way we're supposed to be. Now, I agree with what Jeremy said, I, I you know, I mean, everything he's saying is the same thing that we would be saying. He says it just a different way, you know, reaffirmation practices, re reaffirm relationship, you know? So I'm a hemp farmer, but I'm a hemp farmer, but first I'm a harvester, you know, I'm a farmer. I grow, I like, I harvest all these things in my territory. I spend most of my time trying to keep bad guys from messing up the cool things in my territory, you know, like, you know, maple sugar or pipeline projects, the middle of our wild rice, you know, I, and it's been way too much time on dealing with stupid ideas. So y'all want to give me any help on that, that'd be great, you know, because I got a lot of better ideas than dealing with stupid dead ideas in the last century that should not be here at all, right? We should just be done. We're all ready to move on. Leah and I are right there. We're going, right? Right, Leah? Leah's like, yeah, I'm with you, sister. I'm you know, absolutely with I you. I'm a hemp farmer because of this whole transition, mm -hmm. you know? I'm a hemp farmer because I'm all ready for the next economy. And what you got to do is you got to move from fossil fuels, right? That's just it. You can't sit here and be the way we are. You know, long time ago, our, our people told us, our history told us, leave that stuff in the ground. I was like what our what our folks said. Uh, apparently, y'all didn't get the same instructions. I don't know who missed that set of that memo, but don't let all that stuff out. Carbon's supposed to be in the ground, not in the air. Look what happened, you know. So now we got to get everything back going the right way. Rebuild soil. That's why Leah and I are farmers, right? Make our you know make love back with our relatives, you know. So I grow cannabis because the thing is, is that a long time ago I heard this farmer say it. He said. 100 years ago, or I don't know, we had a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy, mm -hmm. right? And we made the wrong choice. So what I want is that other one. And that's what HEP represents. It's the antidote to a fossil fuels economy besides just quit doing stupid stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Anyway, there's my, there's my two bits to answer <laughs> yours. And then just because he was said some cool stuff. I want to say a little bit about it. So. Absolutely. Thank you. There was, um, when in our exchange, you had mentioned a lot of what a lot of the other tribes are doing and some of the uses. And, and you said this thing about, um, you know, we have the land, like we have plenty of land and just need, yep. you know, the finances, uh, you know, and support to get us to doing what we're doing. However, even within that, a lot of the um, other tribes are, have, kind of latched on to the idea of, of hemp farming and are doing that. Can you talk just a little bit about yeah. how that's growing? Because yeah, the whole me, idea, be honest. Yeah. you know, I think mm -hmm. I was honest in the essay, but you know, I was a late comer to the hemp economy strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, I was busy growing corn, beans, squash, cool stuff. Didn't even like, wasn't growing hemp at all. I just became a, a fam grower about five years ago. I didn't even grow marijuana or cannabis before. Didn't, just still now, but I'm a really good grower, it turns out, mm -hmm. you know? Because I like the plants and they're perfect, you know? So anyway, the thing is, is that Alex Whiteplume and John Trudell are really the hampers, the grandfathers of that movement. And, you know, um, Jail Time and, and, and John Trudell, my inspiration passed on, spirit world. But he's looking at us and giving us a thumbs up. So, you know, those guys started talking about this, but these tribes are very interested, mm -hmm. you know? And there's a lot of tribes that have tried this and now there's this movement. You know, and at the same time, so we're looking at the technology for fiber hemp. The reason I'm talking about this is I'm not talking about medicinal or recreational cannabis for make your head more clear. Right. I'm talking about making canvas, like them damn sales that those guys came over on, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the word canvas comes from cannabis. I'm talking about making a materials economy out of a plant instead of plastic, right? So we have a lot of land. We have a lot of land that's been stolen and alienated you know, we have the same issues the black farmers have, but we are still landed people. We have a lot of acreage and it's prime hemp territory, but what we want is control of production. 
right. you know, that's whatever we, we all know that from the Marx class, you know, I mean, you got to control the means of production, right? right? So anyway, I we want a hemp mill and I'm looking out there. There's all kind of crazy technology. There's a guys in China, you know, there's a guys, I don't know, in Belgium, but we want it here. We wanted it to scale, but make sense, mm -hmm. like appropriately scaled a set of regional, you know, mills scaled mills like all that everybody here is talking about because size matters you don't want it too big because you make an ecological mess yeah so that's what we're working on and a bunch of tribes are interested winona's hemp and our anishinaabe agriculture I'll, I'll make sure i put up the links to it but that's our work there yeah that is fabulous you um what what you're describing right is this uh, a just transition you talk about it as a new green revolution uh, right this sort of revolutionary uh, alternative economy that's based on hemp. I think you just talked about the transition from, uh, you know, from plastic to plant um, seems super revolutionary. But there's something to me that that I think also intersects with what Leah has has written about and talked about um, the sort of intersection of environmental and social issues. And I was struck by Leah your um, article where you say that you talk about racial capitalism as the commodification of our people and the planet for economic gain. Um, can you say more about how our current economic system commodifies people, especially people of color, and how a system um, that is modeled after Afro-Indigenous wisdom would be different? Sure, and um, thank you, Sister Winona, for, for framing, <laughs> teeing that up so beautifully. I am with you. We need to put that carbon back in the soil. Uh, so yeah, our entire uh, food system, and by extension, our entire economy in the West is based on the exploitation of land and labor, full stop. I mean, if you look at the, the current situation in this country, 98% of the value of arable land is white owned, 95% of the acres are white owned. Uh, the people who farm are over 85% people of color, not protected under the Fair Labor Standards Act, yet only two and a half percent of farms are controlled by people of color. Uh, our, our black and brown folks are, are going hungry and suffering from diet related illness at disproportionate rates. You know, at every, every stage you see this monster of racial capitalism eating the essential workers, essentially, and, and turning them into a profit. And I think that it is, it is not just a material problem, it's a spiritual problem. And, you know, I opened my article with a, a story I like to tell of my, uh, some of my elders and mentors in Ghana, West Africa. These are indigenous, black indigenous women, uh, the, the queen mothers who are, you know, in charge of the cultural history of their community. They take care of the sacred groves. In other words, they're watershed scientists uh, and stewards. They do the conflict resolution, they take in orphans, run micro enterprises, I mean, just wonderful elders. And I studied with them for six months. And every morning they would ask me some question and disbelief about life in the US because they hear things through TV and whatnot. And one day Mani Nartiki, who's the Paramount Queen Mother, she said, Leah, is it really true, you know, that the United States, a farmer will put a seed in the ground and they don't pray or dance or sing or, or pour libations or even say thank you to the ground. And then they expect that seed to come up and nourish them. And so, you know, I, I sort of tucked my head in hand. Like, yeah, it's, it's true. That is true. That is by and large the way it's done. And they said, well, clearly that's why you're all sick, right? You're all sick because you treat the earth as a commodity and not as a relative. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, if we make that shift in our hearts, that the earth is a relative and not a commodity, the earth is a grandmother, not a natural resource. The earth is an auntie, not the environment, right? Then everything flows from there. Everything flows from there. For example, in our communities, we have a practice of asking consent of the land before we make big changes to the land. And that seems borderline insane in a Western, you know, Christian civilization. But, but the reality is that, of course, you would ask consent of another human being before you did something to their body, right? That's what we teach our children, I hope. But um, if you see the earth as a thing and not a being, then, then the consent thing starts to sound strange. But, but we have tools of divination like Ifa divination or Zafa, um, also Obi divination, Merindi Logun. These are tools that we use to communicate with the earth to understand, do you want that swamp dug out to become a fish pond? Do you want that forest cut down to become a barn? And if the earth says no, it is a no and we don't do it. And that level of ecological humility, that level of really acknowledging that we as human beings are not supreme, but we are the younger siblings of creation and the, the mountains, the rocks, the, the wind, those are our elder brothers and sisters. We need to be um, 
listening to them, heeding their, their guidance, learning from them about what it is to be a person. And um, I think it is really a principle of Sankofa. It's about going, we need to catch up to our ancestors and then build from there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, Leah. <laughs> I'm like, say, say more. <laughs> all you, all, everything that you all are saying is, is just resonating so much. And it was why that when we were putting this together, we wanted to like have the framing, the theory, concept or whatever, but then bring in those who are doing the, that work, the, the practices, because we often get at yes, questions about, you know, how, how do, how do I do this? You know, how, how do I, am I a part of making this transformation happen? And as destructive as COVID has been, it's also provided a way and an opportunity. It still some people, you know, brought folks to themselves, I guess, if you will, to, to just be open and available to what it is you all are saying now. We're in this transformational moment, right? We're in this moment that these things have been happening already. And Winona and Leah, you all just laid out very well, just the work in detail that you all have been doing for a very long time. And so now that more people are coming into this, it's like, how, how do you respond to those who, who, who experienced that overwhelming, you know, want to go back to normal, whatever that was, because it was so abnormal for so many of us anyway. Um, but who are just overwhelmed by the idea of, of transformation and what that looks like. I think you tell them to take a breath, you know, it's going to be okay. And they say, hey, look around, you know, in my life, I, I saw stuff happen this year that nobody th thought would happen. Like, what about all them darn Columbus statues? Man, how many years we try to get those guys down? They all top along with those Confederate soldiers and a bunch of conquistadors, right? You know, look at the social movement surging. I mean, more people voted than in history. Right, you know, and half of us didn't even want to vote for Joe Biden, but we was all lining up, man. You know, I mean, just, I mean, <laughs> look at that, you know, and we was like organizing like heck, you know, and then you have like, you know, all the, uh, do you notice that Exxon isn't even in the top 10 anymore? Who's that? That's yeah. like Elon Musk and, and uh, Bezos, right? Everything is changing around us. I always go with the pandemic as portal. That's Aaron Dottie Roy. That's what she says, pandemic is portal. Like everything has changed. The whole thing is destabilized. You got a chance to take a breath, grab your pal's hand and walk through the portal. That's what I say. Like, yeah. let's make something beautiful because obviously the food system didn't have a plan. Obviously Texas did not have a plan, mm -hmm. right? Nobody has a plan, but we have a good plan and it's already happening. And now we just breathe life into it and work together. You know, don't let them take your power. Just keep going. You know what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Leah, um, and, I, and I did want to ask this question, but I wanted to get that one in too, just to, to hear from you all to respond to that. But when you talked about asking Mother Earth for permission, how do you know? How do you, you know, how do you get the answer? How do you know that it's a yes or a no? I'll answer that, but I want to, this last question was enticing. And I think Sister Rowan White is the one who exposed me to the idea that we as Black and Indigenous people have actually been survivors of apocalypse. Yep. And mm -hmm. so there is a way that change is really understood as inevitable um, and something we need to lean into and go with. And so for those uh, folks who have not been survivors of apocalypse, it's time to, to lean yeah. into the wisdom of Black folks, yeah. Indigenous folks, Jewish folks, right? Uh, folks who have seen the worst of days, the darkest of days as a people um, confronted near annihilation and then have been able to, to move on. And so uh, I think it is also time to think about uh, shifting of leadership, shifting of who we value as experts. Um, but as far as how do you know what the earth says, here's the good news. Every single one of our traditions, our ethnicities, if you go back far enough, has an earth centered cosmology with a way of communicating with the earth. You just look up divination on Wikipedia and you'll see like hundreds of divination systems. So I will tell you that as a person of West African descent, specifically Dahomey and Yoruba, I use my lineage practices of divination, which I mentioned is Ifa divination, Marin Dilogun Obi. It's something you train in for years. It's something you learn how to use the Oracle. It's something that um, you do with the, the uh, permission of your elders. 
but I guarantee that in everyone's tradition, in everyone's ways, if you go back far enough, you will, you will find your own ways to do that. And I think it's very important that, that we do that step, that we don't appropriate other people's culture, that we cultivate um, our own earth-centered ways of being and that we learn to tune our ears to the earth. Thank you. Thank you. For That's that. fabulous. I, I, I want to respond to that really quickly. Yeah, good. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, what I, what I hear you saying so much, Leah, um, what comes through my mind a lot is what I see as the primary lesson that I wrote about in this article that we can learn from nature when we're applying ecological civilization to our own human society, which this concept of mutually beneficial symbiosis that we don't mm -hmm. do something to extract from uh, some other party. We don't do something to use, see them as a resource, whether they are the people or any part of our fellow um, more than human creatures all around. But we look at how can we relate so that what we do is in everyone's benefit. Uh, so that's that part of like looking at the earth as a part of us that we can regenerate, not try to minimize the harm, but actually regenerate. And then when we think about how we are with other people, how can we be in symbiosis with them, which, which kind of relates to your other question, Zenobia. One of the things we saw when the pandemic hit is this realization around the world, we can trust in our nation states, in those corrupt elected leaders to look after us. And all these amazing mutual aid community groups sprang up just like mushrooms around the world, like with communities looking out for each other. And that hasn't been lost. And that's even been expanded in some places with this recognition, th ideas that have never even been acceptable to even be talked about before now come into mainstream thinking. Things like universal basic income, actually recognizing that everyone has a moral right to be able to have enough money coming in to just give themselves the basics to look after their fundamental needs. That was something couldn't even be talked about now. And now it's like, how much, you know, or uh, how long should it go on? At least it's in the discourse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, something that stands out to me is this um, sort of relationship between changing the way that we think and which has an effect on changing the way that we live. And of course, changing our practices and the way that we live also affects the way that we think. And then there's sort of relationship between thought and action theory and practice that seems to be um, sort of a, a mutually enriching, um, either, either toward destruction or maybe toward flourishing. Um, and there's so many good things that, that obviously you're all saying and things that are also in the, the issue of Yes by other authors. Um, Vandana Shiva is not with us right now, but I know her piece on reclaiming the commons um, is actually absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And she talks about how reclaiming the commons and creating an ecological civilization go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's um, sort of that today, the commons are being enclosed. And mm -hmm. she ex you know, ex describes a variety of ways in the, which that's happening, including among other things, the enclosure of information. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious um, how you all might see the, the sort of an alternative frame, um, like moving uh, toward a commoning approach, toward information, toward resources, toward the natural world, um, how, what, how that would contribute to the creation of an ecological civilization. Can, can I just say something? Yeah. It's not an alternative frame. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, it's like the, the uh, you know, not even sensible. It's, it's, it's the good one. You know, this yeah. is an aberration. It's like saying is industry, like agriculture, conventional agriculture. That's not really conventional agriculture. That's an aberration mm -hmm. of 10,000 years. And so let's not affirm, you know, like that that's a reality. It's a mistake. We hung out for a long time, didn't make that mess over here. You there's know, stupid ideas to... and there's good ideas. This is the yeah. good one. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. Thank yeah. you, Winona. Thank you. <laughs> I think something we struggle with when we them, so, okay. <laughs> when we talk about commons is that you know now we're existing in this frame of, of what we affectionately term white man's law, right? And so uh, we mm -hmm. we bump up against these limits even as we try to reclaim the very very good idea of commons. And I'm talking about land in this case because I'm a farmer. That's sort of the the the, mm -hmm. the world that I live in. And so I'll give you two examples of bumping up against limits. One is that. Um, Black folks, pretty much for all time, have always had a way of caring for land where it's, it's what, what's called kinship commons, where you and your 
siblings and your auntie and your grandma and your children and your great grandchildren uh, care for land together. There's never any, any thought of selling the land, of excluding others from use of the land, um, of depleting the land in a way that it wouldn't be there for generations to come. But you try to do that over here, and that's what black farmers tried to do. And it's called heir property, H-E-I-R property. Now, if you don't leave a will to just a certain heir or, or just a few designated heirs, suddenly it becomes sort of dispersed in this legal soup. And it becomes very vulnerable under US property law, not eligible for USDA loans, not eligible for mortgages, not eligible for financing and programs. And all it takes is one unscrupulous developer to find one distant heir that's moved all the way to Portland, right, from, from Virginia and convince them to sell their one 100th share and they can force auction of the whole property. And then grandma's out and grandpa's out and the, the farm is gone. And that is the leading way that black farmers are losing their land today because they're trying to hold the land in commons, in kinship commons, and that doesn't fit uh, with the way that the state structure property law. We've also run into this because I've helped to form a land trust. Our land is on a co-op. And when we go try to fill out all the paperwork to become a co-op and, and to become a land trust, we suddenly realize, oh, New York State doesn't allow children to have rights to land, right? We, we realize that uh, New York State doesn't allow nature to have the, the rights of sovereignty and, and self-determination. So our whole divination that you can't put that in there. Uh, we tried to establish a cultural respect easement so that the Mohican people upon whose land we're on could have perpetual rights. And we ran into blocks there. Now, luckily we have a really cool pro bono legal team and we're working it out and we're figuring it out, but it should not take years of effort mm -hmm. to figure out how to make a paper that says these people are gonna share the land in their ancestral ways, right? And so, so fundamentally, there's some dismantling to do of the, the assumptions of US property law, but all the way back to the BS doctrine of discovery and up into what we have now so that we really can uh, restore the good ideas, Winona said, of, the, of sharing, of sharing the land. Of, why wouldn't we do that, right? Beautiful, yeah. yeah. And if I can just add one more thing to that. Um, like, and as you're saying, Andrew, what, what Vanden Shiva wrote about in that article was so, so great was to look, to realize that commons, of course, land is fundamental, just as, as, as you were talking about, Leah, but then so much else is part of our commons, our air, our water, uh, our, uh, just the, the soil that's being depleted, um, our oceans. And then even beyond that is this realization that the vast bulk of what we all take for granted in terms of human knowledge and understanding, just everything from the basics like language um, to the basics of technologies or even more recent technologies like electricity and it, it, the internet, all that is part of untold generations of people, of our ancestors working hard to create something that is everyone's heritage. And then some, some high-tech entrepreneur comes along, puts a couple of things together, and then earns like you know, tens of billions of dollars and, and, and basically takes advantage of that commons that is available to all of us. So it's this concept that I get excited by is this notion of the commonwealth. And the commonwealth is all that is available to us as human beings. And what we need to do is actually build a civilization based on this recognition that every human being who's born and it has that as part of their heritage, has a right to share in that commonwealth. It's a fundamental change from our current like enclosure-based society. Hmm. Thank you, Andrew, for bringing Vandana into the space too though, because I, I um, she had made this uh, in one of her talks some, a while back, she, she had said that the way you design the world in your mind is the way you relate to it in reality. And I'm paraphrasing just a little bit. When you design the world as dead matter to be exploited, you will exploit it. When you design without any understandings of limits, you will violate those limits. But if you design it with recognition of interconnectedness, you'll, you'll nurture it. And, um, and I'm just wondering, Jeremy, because you do write about this a little bit in your piece, um, ex um, examples of what we, that are happening in other places in the world that are reclaiming those comments outside of the US. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, right. Well, of course, the uh, two of you, Winona and Leah, are just the best possible examples of what we're doing here, yeah. in, here in this country. Um, and well, I think, you know, one, one great example uh, of what's going on is this movement to declare ecocide a crime, where it's this recognition that the corporations come along and they don't just uh, extract 
and cause pollution. They actually destroy ecosystems, which again is our global commons that we share with all of life. And there's this amazing uh, movement that has actually been so powerful now that it's the it, governments in Europe are beginning to look seriously at changing jurisdiction that with at the International Criminal Court in The Hague um, to actually define ecocide as a crime. So some big corporate executive who thinks they're above the law because uh, to the extent any nation state tries to do anything to them, they know they can just bribe their way out of it and they basically own them anyway, but suddenly they could get hauled into the court and accused of a, of, of a crime that could lead them to serving time in jail. That's the kind of example where we have to recognize we've got to stand up as a global community and bring back the commons from us being enclosed. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Andrew, did you have any follow-ups for any of the panels before we move over to the? I, I think we. I think this actually ties nicely into the the questions and answers that we. So we're getting great questions from our audience right now, um, and a lot of these are getting upvoted, right? And the most popular question we have, <coughs> excuse me, is about um, applying in learning from indigenous uh, cultures and applying indigenous cultural practices without appropriation. And I'm wondering, Winona, if, <coughs> if you can speak to that, um, perhaps some guidelines for how to, um, how to, you know, to, yeah. You know what I'd say for, there's two things I'd tell you to do prior to start with. Uh, I always tell everybody, go to the river and pray. That'd be good. That's what I tell everybody. And, and, and in the middle of March, they're gonna to try to, Enbridge is gonna kind of drill under 22 rivers in Minnesota. So we tell you all come to Minnesota rivers and pray. There's 22 of them, you can do that on a map. But the, but, but the second thing, you know, is be a water protector. I mean, if you, if you know, I mean, what I'm trying to say is, is that I could say do this or that, you know, but part of it is the gratitude of the action, you know, and, and, the, and the action, it's like really cool to like eat some indigenous food and, and you know, have some things, but you know, who are we as spiritual beings? You know, be those spiritual beings and pray hard, you know? And wherever you are, there is some struggle that is a mirror of mine, you know? Everywhere there is these same things, it's this conflict between, I call it Wendigo economics, mm -hmm. you know, economics of a cannibal. There's this conflict between the cannibals and mother earth, you know? And it's going on everywhere, you know, and we're on the right side, you know, that's what we're working on. But sometimes you get that cannibal tendency. So you got to knock that one out, you know? Yeah. I just mean being the country that consumes a third of the world's resources or something, we ought to just like not pretend, right? <laughs> yeah. And imprisons the most people in the world too, um, which is a great question in here about how does this ecological civilization vision and practice connect to prison abolition, transformative justice, and migrant justice, because those are real issues that we're dealing with in the US right now, right? So it I think they're all so connected because that's why we need to frame this as fundamentally a problem of racial capitalism and settler colonialism, because the project is to gobble up the earth and gobble up folks of color to create profits. And it's really the same beast, right? And so I do not think that you can have um, the liberation of land without the liberation of the people. And you cannot have the liberation of the people without the liberation of the land. Absolutely abolition. And these things have been so tied historically, like take, for example, the loophole in the 13th Amendment, which says you can go ahead and have chattel slavery so long as you've managed to convict someone of a crime. So the South freaking out about the end of formal slavery creates a whole bunch of new laws. Uh, it's illegal to loiter. I mean, standing around, it's illegal to be a vagrant. That means not having a job. It's illegal to not be upright, industrious, and honest. Tell me how you define that one. And the punishment for which is to be thrown into prison and then to be rented back to the plantation, the mines, and the railroads, a practice which continues to this day. So you can see how the incarceration, mass incarceration, and the exploitation of the earth are fundamentally about othering. They're fundamentally about seeing um, the earth and all of the beautiful human and non-human siblings who dwell on the earth as a resource to be gobbled up for the few. And we are not, and we are not. And I think when we stand together, like mm -hmm. arm in arm with the buffalo and with the rivers and with the rainforest, and we say like, we are people, we are all people and you cannot exploit us. We're actually stronger in that. 
when, when you talk about how everything's interconnected and we talk about how all of our um, challenges are interconnected, doesn't it get overwhelming? Like, where do you start? Like, how do you tackle sort of this complex web of global, you know, uh, oppression? Like, it, there's historical roots there. There's uh, obviously issues of power. Like, where, where, where do you Andrew, don't get all twirled up there. Come on. <laughs> kind of one thing at a time, man. Everybody's got their little part, right? You know what I'm saying? Is it's like, so some people are good at some, some different, you know, things. I get it, you know, but, but, you know, you just go, you just start, you know, and I, I look out there and like, I know some sisters working on prison abolition and I'm with, right with her. I mean, I'm working on getting rid of slavery of mother earth. You know, it's the same thing, right? You know, and, and then, you know, I look out there and someone's doing this healing work. Well, you know, my job is gardening. That's healing. You know, I mean, we, we all got our, we all got our pieces, you know, and just, so that so that's that's it. And if you look out there, you know, well, first of all, I always want to say a little while here. We our word is a king, a king. That means the land to which the people belong. In a king amen, the the very land to which I belong. Now I want to say that because we're talking about the commons. We use this other term, you know, the land to which we belong. Not that the land belongs to us in common. It's that we actually belong to the land, right? That's a different construct. And that's what I think part of what we need is change that construct, you know? Because that all that property stuff Lee, is right dead on on that. Like that's all like not, that's not right. And we all know it's not right. You know, at some gut level, we know that we don't own any of that stuff. The creator owns us, you mm -hmm. know, we don't own, you know? And then the other thing is, of course, we got to deal with our addiction to stuff because we're at this point in our society where we rent places to store stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know? And we just got too much stuff and there's more stuff than the world. Isn't yeah. there more stuff than the whole human, like the biological world now? Yeah. Right? There's more stuff than elephants, right? I was like, come on, quit with the stuff, right? Yeah. So, you know, you just start one piece at a time and, re and go back to relationship, like what Leah is saying. And also what Jeremy is saying. You know, this is about reaffirming relationship, getting back. And in that process, there's a lot that are, you know, I, you know, I just look like globalization, the antidote to globalization is relocalization. And how's that happen? Well, it's happening right now because I can't get a shrimp from the, that was, you know, grown in, grown in Scotland, deveined in China and arrive at a Walmart near me anymore. Right. I mean, I'm saying it's happening because of these crises, right? Mm -hmm. And so keep, keep making local. That's how you make the change. And that helps deconstruct and holds responsibility because everybody here knows if you buy from somebody, you know, you're going to have a better relationship than if you buy from, you know, some place that has like food slavery. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Benina. Thanks for that. Like if I can add one more like element to, uh, to what you're just saying, one of those principles that we learn from nature when you think about society is this notion of what's called fractal organization. Like in nature, we look at a vast ecosystem, so vast, and yet it's like it comes, it arises from tiny little things like sing, single cells and tiny little organisms all expanding out as part of bigger and bigger concentric holes. And that's like a fractal organization, meaning that the principles that apply in those little things actually apply to the whole ecosystem. So the kind of same holds true. Um, like Adrian Marie Brown talks about this notion of activism as a as a fractal um, as, as a fractal engagement with life, and we can learn from that and apply, and take that wisdom and just think in terms of we don't have to solve all the problems ourselves. We we like look at what we can be engaged in. We apply those principles of ecological civilization, those principles of life affirming relationship to our small communities and to be part a small part of those bigger global system changes. Is. We need to always keep that in mind, but we don't all try to fix it ourselves. Just be part, connect to that, like that mycorrhizal fungal network um, of all the different changes happening underground. That's what we need to be doing. Yeah, yeah. And Leah, you you bring that up in your piece, um, Adrian Marie Brown, work in emerging strategies um, about the one element of ecological civilization, um, cultural biomimicry. You want to respond or, or just kind of Tag on that Absolutely. All. And I just feel like Sister Adrienne's uh, ears must be ringing because I just had a conversation with her right before this. She is, I just, 
read all the things, just read all the things. <laughs> Undrowned, most recently, you got to read that. Uh, but yeah, cultural biomimicry is, you know, roughly defined as the idea that to figure out what we're supposed to be doing as humans, we should be paying attention to our elder brothers and sisters, which is the earth. So for example, right, if a pine tree is at the edge of the forest getting a whole lot of extra sunlight because it's self-facing, it does not actually take all its photosynthates to become 10 times taller than the other trees around it. It takes those sugars and minerals and messages and goodness and dumps it down into a network of fungal mycelium to share with kin and non-kin so that the trees can grow together, so they can mass together, so that they're able to um, share resources in times of trouble, warn of an invading insect. That's how the forest superorganism works. There's Western science to back that up. I'm not just being metaphorical, but we as human beings get really confused. We're like, oh, I'm getting a lot of extra sunshine. Let me just accumulate. Let me become super wealthy. Let me put higher fences. And so uh, a, a form of cultural biomimicry would, would say, well, how do we actually share like the forest? How do we become interdependent like the forest? Uh, the fractal patterning is another example, the uniqueness of waves, the dispersal of the dandelion. We can look to nature and realize that she's always talking to us and always reminding us of who we actually are. There is a question about uh, permaculture. I'm happy to, to talk about that. You know, I think the permaculture frame is one of the most profound and significant ways of rethinking our relationship with the natural world, rethinking how humans can tend nature um, and the whole notion of stacking functions. And, and, and what, what I love in it is, it, again, it learns, it recognizes um, indigenous knowledge as the foundation for these deep layers of understanding, looks at what nature does, and then says, you know, how can this be applied in, in a like, broader context all around the world? I think it's an absolute integral part of an ecological civilization. And at the same time, and the concept of an ecological civilization extends to basically every aspect of how we organize ourselves as human beings on the living earth. So it extends to everything like how we change ideas of education, change ideas of law, just like um, you were mentioning before Zenobia, this notion of going from uh, justice being this kind of revenge based to restorative justice and transformative justice, this recognition of the individual dignity of all beings on earth together. Um, so in every aspect, um, the ecological civilization can apply in permaculture, principles would be a central part of that, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, I wanted to kind of, because the way that we talk about the framing of ecological civilization is the, the in interconnectedness, uh, reclaiming the commons, interconnectedness with nature, and more um, a focus mostly on the environment. But the economy pays, plays a, a, a big role in this too. As a matter of fact, we do have some um, articles in the print and on digital and in the hard copy. So make sure y'all get it and read it, um, where we uh, talk about Kate Rayworth's work. Um, our senior editor or, um, wrote an article, um, interviewed Kate and talks about her, her donut economics. And so um, there's a question here about, this says that when capitalism is still the main and prevailing economic system most of us have, how do you um, tangibly, right, look through this ecological civilization lens, um, not just ideologically or as a connect to environment and nature, but as, as an economy, um, yeah. So some examples that people can use to, the practice of it. Right, so it's like we're, we're, we're talking about connecting back to nature, but then how does this capitalistic system that we all are suffering under play a role in this as well? Well, you know, I, I just think feel like here in Northern Minnesota, we're just kind of living in this moment. And I'm looking at, you know, I, one day I'm stand, you know, driving down this country road and I get there and I'm like, and there's this, there's a slow moving traffic guy I had like lights flashing coming towards me. And I'm like, holy buckets, man. I got to pull over side two lane road. And I'm, 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 my car is parked on the pipeline, right? And right by me comes these giant wind turbine parts. And I was like, whoa, looks like there's this intersection of these two economies at this very moment in this very place. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's exactly where we are. You know, I mean, we're in this place where you have this whole, like the global economy is not doing well. It's kind of a big mess. We'll go with that description right now, you know? And, and, I, and I feel like at the same time, 
you know, you know what I did? I got quarantined and you know who I got quarantined with? Fabulous. I'm having the best time of my life. Don't tell anybody except for I do miss my friends. But you know, so I got quarantined with like six 14 year olds who wanted to farm. Go to the sugar bush with my neighbors, the Amish, you know? So I just saw the restoration of like a local economy between the Amish and the Anishinaabe. We call it the Amishinaabe economy, actually. You guys are the first time hearing this publicly, but it's like a little joke, but it's like, so you do with what you got or you make what you have work, right? So I got this like really interesting moment where, you know, I used to fly, I bet you all used to fly too. I don't fly at all anymore, right? Stay home, all good. You look out there and you see the opportunity to rebuild something and you take that time, you know? So we got this growth of this local, you know, this resurgence and that's, you know, what happens because globalization and all those guys are predicated on endless access to fossil fuels and energy, you know, and that's kind of a big gamble. And, you know, so just bet on mother nature and keep doing the right thing. That's like what I think is now is the time to just keep building it and, and, and fight those guys, divest, you know, take their, starve them. You gotta starve them, take their money, you know, and then just build something better. That wouldn't take much, would it? <laughs> it's a mess, their ideas, so make cool stuff. Yeah, and, it, and it's possible too. I was watching one of Andana's pieces where she talked about how, um, I think it was Masanto at the time, how when they reclaimed their seed production, right? And what and they weren't using their seeds and how Masanto had lost like eleven million dollars or something. I mean, it was a it was a billion dollar industry at the time, but but that was still a dent. That was something, right? So we're not hopeless in that end. There is something that we can do. Um, Leo or Jeremy, you all wanna respond to that question about capitalism? I mean, I'm not an economist, but I don't think you need to be to see that it's not working so well. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me to be fundamentally predicated on taking more than it returns because the earth is getting sucked dry and then wages need to be kept low to leave a profit margin. And then all of the bad stuff needs to be externalized, like all the problems that result from polluting the air and people's health and freeze freezing over of the south and, and wildfires have to be externalized so those costs end up on the public instead of being paid for by the corporations that that cause them so i just i think the math just doesn't work out um and there are ways that people try to tweak capitalism things thinking like a wealth cap or a wealth tax or universal basic income you know universal health care and i think those are steps in the right direction and they save a lot of lives in the short term um but capitalism isn't that old. Um, and so I think we, we might want to fundamentally rethink if this economic system is going to be compatible with ecological civilization. And, you know, even though it's a, a microeconomic system, I, again, I always look to our ancestors and what they figured out and the, the women of, of West Africa and later the Caribbean, later African-Americans had an economic system called the SUSU, which fundamentally was like everyone puts a little bit in yeah. at a, a designated time of the month and then the susuma who's the trusted elder who's not going to steal anyone's money or lose it holds on to it and then when it's your turn you get something out of the pot that you need so that you can send your kid to school or rethought your market stall or buy a cow or, or whatever it is that you need and you continue to be part of this reciprocal um, economy that's about sharing and equality and each each person contributing according to their needs and taking according to their needs. So uh, we, we could scale up something like that and, and rethink an economy that actually serves uh, the people on the earth who, who comprise it. Well, you know, Leah, for, for, for someone who says she's not an economist, you sure <laughs> have some great economic wisdom that, uh, that a lot of those traditional economists could really learn from. Yeah, I mean, what I would just add to that is one, if you're interested in really getting a sense of thinking about economics from a different point of view, best thing you can do is to just get that book by Kate Rayworth called Donut Economics, which really gives us amazing, um, clear and structured way to rethink about it and throws out a lot of those mainstream ideas. And if you're thinking about from a practical standpoint, a couple of things are simple. Just recognize those transnational corporations, 69 of the largest 100 economists of the world are actually the transnationals and they are driven. Their DNA is to basically exploit 
to keep growing shareholder profits at all, at all costs and to turn humans into basically consumer zombies, to turn the earth into nothing but a resource to exploit. The, one of the best things we can do is just make those decisions not to take part in anything, not to buy anything, to, dress, to take part in uh, other parts of the economy that doesn't like subsidize that. And if you've got great ideas and you're part of something you want to grow, try to avoid starting it in some sort of for-profit way. Look at a cooperative worker co-op based structure. Look at a commons based structure, just like Leah and Winona have been talking about. And that's the way in which each of us can move together towards a fundamentally different economy. I'll say my last words for now, um, and this builds off of what uh, Winona was saying about, you know, each person sort of having their niche. Uh, one of the models that I really appreciate is the, the four wings of the butterfly of transformative social justice. Uh, butterfly doesn't fly with one, two, or three of its winglets, it needs them all. And so if you imagine sort of on this wing over here that you have uh, resist, that's the blockades, the protests, uh, the, the work stoppages, Right. And then and then on the next wing down here, you have reform, you know, so that's the folks who are trying to infiltrate the system, the school teachers, the elected officials, the people getting into the prosecutor's office and trying to get sentencing lower and all that. And then you have on this third wing over here, the builders. Those are those of us who make alternative institutions like freedom schools, farms, health clinics, and so on. And then the, the final wing is the healers, because there's a whole lot of trauma. So we need the conflict mediators. We need the therapists. We need the preachers. You know, the singers, the dancers, the artists, all the folks are going to make us well. And that together makes that butterfly fly. And so it's not about which is the one right thing to do or which is more holier than thou, but really about supporting each other to find that intersection of what the world needs and what makes us each come alive. Yeah, I guess um, the one thing I would just leave everyone with is just to um, recognize that this whole vision of an ecological civilization, it's not like somebody else's vision. If you care about life. If you are working anything that's life affirming, it's your vision. And it's not going to happen because some people out there are kind of changing this or making this happen. It's going to happen because all of us connect with each other to actually move towards what is really ultimately the largest movement ever in history, this movement towards a life affirming future that millions of organizations around the world are all part of. And once we recognize we're all pushing in that same direction, it, it's like all of us together can co-create that life-affirming future. We can see how dismal things are looking in so many ways out there, but we know that it's possible to transform it when enough of us actually work together to make that happen. Um, you know, just honored to be here for everyone today. You know, I think of our, our phrase, <coughs> Minna Pabana Zewin, that means the good life. It's kind of like gross national happiness indexing, you know? And that's, uh, you know, what we do. It's because quality of life is associated with, with that, which the, my, you know, my fellow panelists are talking about, relationship to earth, to each other, intergenerational relationship, you know, responsibility and, and um, you know, that everyone has their opportunity, you know, or their moment in time, and this is ours, you know? And so whatever it is we do, do it your best and then do it a little better. That's what I say, you know, do your best and then do a little better. And uh, believe, you know, believe because there's a lot of people out there that are doing good things. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's how change is made. You know, that's how change is made together. Thank you, Miigwech. Thank you, Winona. Andrew, you wanna just share a little bit about um, the Institute of Ecological Civilization? I mean, because this is y'all's sure. work and what you all are doing. So you wanna just say something? Yeah, so the Institute for Ecological Civilization is a US-based nonprofit that actually specializes in this sort of uh, new possible paradigm, the, the, the right way of doing things, right, Winona? Um, not the, you know, getting rid of those bad ideas and replacing them with good ones. Um, uh, so uh, Jeremy Lent and I are actually gonna be uh, collaborating on a, a dialogue series that sort of is taking what we've just done um, and go deeper and go further. Um, so I hope, please uh, check that out with us. Um, should be a lot of fun. But yeah, I think this is a great, cross-section of, of what the yes issue on ecological civilization uh, demonstrates. And it's just, it's just brilliance. And I actually, I'm so honored that you're all here. Um, it's wonderful to listen to you all day long. Yeah, I mean, and we've had so many questions and continue to have them uh, still the hows and the whys and the not sures. And so I just wanna invite all of our participants to um, follow the work that 
Leah's doing at Soul Fire. She's on Twitter. <laughs> so just at soulfire.farm, um, not dot anything, but Soul Fire Farm <laughs> on Twitter. Uh, Winona is um, Winona's Hemp on Twitter. And Jeremy, you can find him on Twitter. And get, look, okay. Y'all need to pick up this. Right. If you, don't, if you don't have it already, subscribe and get it. And you can find their contact information in our latest issue and online at yesmagazine.org. I think that is about all the time that we have right now. And so I just want to thank you all for joining us. It was such a pleasure um, to just see the numbers of people who joined us for this conversation and just to be in community right now with Jeremy, Leah, and Winona. Um, every day at Yes, we seek to elevate hope and inspiration among our readers with our Better World Today newsletter. So I invite you again to sign up for that. And to just also think on this, what would change if what I do, what you do, is a response of equitable transformation? And just remember every change is first and foremost a personal one. And so I just wanna just send love out to um, Winona Leah and Jeremy again and Andrew for co-hosting with us and to all of you and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Peace everyone. Bye, thank you.